Eddie Chavez. Ruben Nava. And Jesse Romero. Jesus 911. Soul Patrol, Jesus 911, two man car, we're 10 8. Eddie, are you are you 10 8? Jess, I'm 10 8 and ready for business here. Clear for calls. Uh, today's the feast day of Saint, Saint Andre Bassett. Pray for us. Uh, Eddie, we want to continue. There's a topic that's uh, of interest to Catholics. It's been of interest to Catholics for decades since the movie came out. <clears throat> it's the movie The Exorcist that came out in 1973. It was inspired by an, an actual uh, an, an actual event that happened back in 1949. And we're reading the notes, the actual diary of the priest that was there and recorded the exorcism. We're going to make a lot of commentary today more than anything else, uh, at least for the last two segments. But let's pick it up where we ended off, Eddie. We 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 ended off uh, <clears throat> on, on Thursday, March 24th. So let's pick it up today on Friday, March 25th. You want to you want to continue? Yeah, just sure. We should just mention this is this is uh, the diary that one of the attending exorcists uh, kept. Uh, and and this was done, like you said, back in 1949. But it starts off right now, uh, Friday, March 25th. And, and this is what it says. Some of the uh, text is redacted. So when we come across a word like that, we'll uh, we'll say the word uh, redacted. At the rectory, Robbie, Robbie was very restless and could not sleep. The group of priests prayed outside his door. For, be, for brief periods, Robbie fell into fitful tossing, which was not real sleep. On one occasion, Robbie fell out of bed but was not hurt. Next, he walked awkwardly into the arms of Father Bodern and Van Roo. Shortly before midnight, midnight, he lay prone on his back with his arms stiff at his side. He began, a, he began a leg and arm movement as a gymnastic exercise. His arms, re, uh, his arms mewed and out straight from his body and then moved back in straight lines to to the side of his body. There was no noise. After midnight, there was some pitching about, but not for long intervals. Robbie cursed his father and spit at him, and then he kicked at the priests at his bedside. He pushed a nearby chair with his foot several times and finally fell into a deep sleep at 1 a.m. This was Friday night, the uh, the 10th night since the exorcism was begun. Perhaps the X given on the first night was meant to mean 10 days. This was a a mark on on uh, one of Robbie's legs. uh, On Monday night, the redacted home was blessed by Father Bodern. No disturbances occurred Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday nights, and Robbie was getting back to normal life. Thursday, March 31st. At 11.30... p.m. Robbie went downstairs and complained that he was feeling ill and that his feet felt cold then hot. When the family went up to the bedroom with him, the disturbances began. First, the shaking of the bed. He began to write on the sh- on the sheet with his finger, explaining between spells that he seemed to be reading from a blackboard. They were unable to make out what he was writing on the sheet. Then he began to talk, telling what he saw on the blackboard. Notes taken by his cousin are as follows. I will stay 10 days, but will return in four days. If redacted stays, gone to lunch. If you stay and become a Catholic, it will stay away. Redacted. Go ahead, Eddie. It says, uh, God will uh, take away, will take it away four days after it is gone, 10 days. God is getting powerful. The last day when it quits, it will leave a sight, a sign on my front. Father Bishop, all people that ma- uh, mangle with me will die a terrible death. Family called rectory about midnight. Father Bodern and Van Roo arrived at the house at about 1 a.m. And Father Bodern began the rite of exorcism. At the Principio, Robbie, in a spell, called for a pencil. At this point, and frequently at the beginning of subsequent spells, he addressed one or both of the two persons, Pete, most frequently, and Joe. 
Taking the pencil, he began to write with it on the head of the bed, which was covered with a white cloth. This type of spell was writing, uh, this type of spell and writing was repeated perhaps eight or ten times. When he wrote, what he wrote was recorded for the most part. The family washed away the writing a few times, making room for more, and redacted, fastened large sheets of wrapping paper to the bed. The following is a record of the mo- of most of the writings, uh, though it is not complete. Some of the things written were repeated. Number one, yeah. in answer to the first set of questions, he wrote the Roman numeral 10, X. It was clearly the numeral with crossbars at the top and bottom. This was written four times on the first occasion and was repeated several times during the exorcism, usually in an answer to the question diem. Number which, two. Which, mean, which means day, by the way, in Latin, diem. Day. Uh, number two. I will stay ten days and then return after the four days are up. Number three. I am the devil himself. You will have to pray a month in the Catholic Church. Number four, in an answer to the comment to uh, to give nomen lingue latina, I speak the language of the persons. Word language was misspelled. I will put in redacted mind when he makes up his mind that the priests are wrong about writing English. I will, that is the devil, will try to get his mother and dad to hate the Catholic Church. I will answer in the spite, in the name of spite. Number five. In ten days, I will give a sign on his chest, and he will have to, uh, and have it covered to show my power. Number six. He drew a strange thing that looks somewhat like a map, uh, with the two thousand feet written on it, apparently connected with the early dreams about hidden treasures, and and a map to find it. I believe that it was on it was in this connection that he spoke also, saying, Yeah, this is what I got on the Ouija board. He drew a face also and wrote the words Dead Bishop. Number seven. You may not believe me, then Robbie will suffer forever. Number eight. When commanded to give a sign in Latin, he wrote meaningless marks on the paper, not even letters of the Roman alphabet. Friday, April 1st. <clears throat> Robbie had been taking, taking instructions on Catholic doctrine since Wednesday, March 23rd, under the direction of Father McMahon. Robbie's father and mother leaving Robbie's choice of religion to himself. Mistake, mistake. They had agreed that Robbie would not be confirmed in the Lutheran Church as, been, as had been plan, planned previously. With the relapse into five days of respite, the mother, the father, and Robbie agreed that the proper thing to do was to have, was to have Robbie baptized a Catholic. Sponsors were picked, and the baptismal party was to arrive at the college church between 8 and 8.30 p.m. As the party of five relatives drove from Robbie's home, Robbie felt a strange sensation in his feet. There were alterations of hot and cold feelings, and and the Robbie went into one of his spells. He began by saying, So you are going to baptize me, ha ha, and you think you will drive me out with Holy Communion, ha ha. Robbie grabbed the steering wheel of the automobile and his uncle was forced to pull up to the curb in order to subdue subdue the violence. Robbie stiffened and fought. It was a major task to remove him from the front seat and force him into the back seat of the car. Robbie's father and uncle held Robbie in the back seat while the aunt drove. Even with with careful supervision, Robbie leapt up to seize his aunt as she drove An interesting sidelight is that the radio in the car would not operate while Robbie was in a spell, although it worked before and after. In the college church rectory, another hard struggle almost made it impossible for three men to carry Robbie from the church, uh, from the car to the rectory. Inside the door of the rectory, Robbie shouted and spit. He was thrown on the floor of one of the parlors. His physical violence 
Even ice cold water had little effect on him upon him. The father and uncle were completely exhausted from the battle. Robbie was carried to the third floor of the rectory and placed on the bed. There was little hope that the baptism could be administered at the baptismal font in the presence of the chosen sponsors. Michael, the workman, was chosen as proxy. Robbie was in and out of his seizures for short periods, but there was not enough time for the long profession of faith and abjuration of heresy. Father Bodern and Robbie had 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 um, Father Bodern and Robbie repeat the words of a briefer form. Then the regular procedure for the baptism of infants followed. However, when Robbie was asked, "Dost thou renounce Satan?" he went off into a spell. The action was repeated three or four times, but Robbie went off before he could answer the question with the words, "I do renounce him." Eddie, we'll stop here. We'll pick it up on the next segment. Do you want to just make some comments? And uh, what yeah, are we reading? Yeah, just you know, we we are reading a a diary kept by Father Raymond Bishop, who was one of the attending uh, exorcists at the uh, exorcism of of. Uh, it looks like his name is Robbie Henkeler. I'm not sure if that's uh, accurate, but we know him as Robbie in the story. So whenever we say Robbie, we're talking about the young man who was portrayed in the 1973 movie The Exorcist as as a female, as a girl, by uh, by Linda Blair. So we are uh, we're going to go through and uh, continue uh, reading this uh, particular uh, uh, this diary, and then at some point later on uh, today, we'll uh, start making commentary. From the beginning. You're listening to Jesus 911. We'll be right back. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is Jesse Romero. Join me on a pilgrimage of faith and discovery to Poland for the 100th year anniversary of the birth of St. John Paul II in May of 2020. Together we'll experience the faith, beauty, and culture of Poland and become imbibed with the spirit of John Paul II. We'll visit the town of Wadowice, where John Paul was born, and the city of Krakow, where he was ordained and later became bishop. We'll also travel to Jasnogora and visit Our Lady of Czestochowa, and we'll have a chance to venerate the original image of the merciful Jesus at St. Faustina's convent and the city that St. Maximilian Kolbe built for the Immaculata. Finally, we'll pay a visit to Auschwitz, where St. Maximilian Kolbe was martyred. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to worship and discover your own faith at places where St. John Paul II grew in his own love for our Lord. For more information or how to join this pilgrimage, visit my website at jesseromero.com. Sirach 1124 says, Do not say I am self-sufficient. What harm can come to me now? According to St. Catherine of Siena, presumption is like vermin burrowing at the root of the tree of our soul. If we do not uproot it with great care and humility, it will eventually destroy the soul. May God keep us from all presumption of mind and heart and realize that we depend on Him for everything. selling your home or your business property this is terry barber real estate for life underwrites the terry and jesse show and they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world and when they receive their referral fee they will give 80 percent of it to a pro-life organization wow that's 80 percent realestateforlife.org 877-LIFE-US-1 Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Soul Patrol 108 to uh, retired cops for Christ, uh, faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, devoted to the Blessed Virgin Mary under the patronage of St. Michael the Archangel, patron saint of cops, uh, pray for us. us. Eddie, we're, uh, we're, we're uh, sharing the notes the diary from the actual movie from the actual uh exorcism, exorcism. sessions that 
that uh, ended up becoming a 1973 blockbuster movie, The Exorcist, written by William Blatty. So we'll continue before we make another segment. Uh, go ahead, Ed. So um, it says here that we're, we're joining the story when uh, they're trying to baptize the the person that, that is possessed, uh, and he he refuses or is unable to, to say, I do renounce him. Finally, Robbie was normal long enough to give the answers. When Father Bodern came to the baptism proper, the physical uh, resistance exceeded any violence of the evening. Wow. Robbie uh, remained conscious for the words, Ego te baptispo in nomine patris. And then there was a violent upheaval. Nonetheless, the baptism was completed with a generous amount of baptismal water. It seemed from the reactions that the Lutheran baptism had not been administered properly or that it had never taken effect. After the baptism, the prayers of the exorcism were continued. The usual spitting, gyrating, cursing, and physical violence continued until 11.30 p.m. Saturday, April 2nd. Robbie awakened at 9.30 a.m. but was not calm. He threw a pillow at the light and broke the shade in the bulb. The crockery basin in his room was likewise shattered. This was the morning when Robbie was to receive his first Holy Communion. Father's Bishop and O'Flattery were called in to assist Father Bodern in the preparation for Holy Communion. It was evident that the struggle was at hand. There was no difficulty in going through the conditional confession. Perhaps this quietness indicated again that the baptism of the preceding night had taken effect. When Father Bodern began the prayers for the Holy Communion, Robbie went into his spell, kept his eyes shut and his mouth closed. But he was not hard to hold at this time. Robbie rallied for brief moments, yet whenever Father Bodern brought the Eucharistic particle near Robbie, the boy went into his spell. On five different occasions, when the particle was placed in Robbie's mouth, he spit it out onto the corporal or purification, which was always held in front of his mouth, or caution. Inside cover of the Roman ritual, the official exorcism book for the Roman Catholic Church. After nearly two hours of vain attempts, Father O'Flattery suggested that we pray the rosary in honor of Our Lady of Fatima, especially since this was the first Saturday of the month when the fathers had completed the rosary. Another attempt was made with the Holy Communion. This time, Robbie was able to swallow and he made his first Holy Communion um, under extraordinary opposition. Eddie, continue. Robbie finished dressing himself and prepared to leave for home. Father Bodern asked Father O'Flaherty to drive the car while he himself, Robbie's father, and Robbie sat in the back seat. It was about 11.45 a.m. Only a few minutes after the car was in motion, Robbie jumped up off the seat and grabbed Father O'Flaherty and had to be pulled off with force. Robbie was not normal on the road for more than a few minutes at a time. At home, he came to long long enough to eat a fairly good-sized breakfast. During the remainder of the day, there was only brief intervals of consciousness. The sacraments had stirred up Satan more than any other priestly administration. The family was nervously worn uh, from the long day of fighting. Fathers Bodern, Bishop O'Flaherty, and Michael arrived at Robbie's home at 7.40 p.m. Spells continued. There was no response to the Precipio before 8.40 p.m. One short spell of less than a minute occurred between 8.40 and 11.15 p.m. During this period, Robbie ate a dish of ice cream. At 11.15, Robbie ran, uh, ran downstairs and sat on the arm of a parlor chair. He was becoming so nervous that he could scarcely stay in the bedroom. Father Bodern feared that Robbie would become violent downstairs, so he asked Robbie to go back to the bedroom. Robbie trotted up the stairs in a boyish, boyish fashion, turned into his bedroom, and ran straight for the reliquary of the Holy Cross. Father O'Flaherty caught his hand in time, but Robbie reached for the open uh, ritual and tore four pages out of the exorcism formula. He grasped with lightning grasped with lightning speed. Then followed in a a spell in which Father Bodron commanded that Robbie should respond in Latin to the Principio. Dicas rini nomen tum et oran exitus tui finalis. 
The only responses were a, re a repetition of the Latin words followed by a remark redacted or by no or by a laugh of ridicule. By Eddie, let me just jump in. Yes. What, what Father said in, in Latin and English, I went to the translator. He said, tell me your name and the hour when you will exit. That's what he said. Okay. Yeah. At 12 p.m., spells continue with the same type of responses to the Principio. There was jumbled mockery of the Latin questions. However, at this stage, writing appeared on the boy. The letters go were printed in red as they were on the first night of the exorcism. At the command, Dicas Mihi Tierri, tier, tell, me the day. Him, tell me the day, tell me the day, three parallel scratches appeared on, right, on Robbie's thigh. At Oram, an X was branded. Three, three S's were branded on different parts of Robbie's body. At 1.15 a.m., Robbie was so nervous that he begged to get out of bed and sit on the chair. His hands trembled in a nervous frenzy. He begged his father to take him back to Washington on Sunday. He could not stand the ordeal any longer. He feared going crazy. Relief came at 1.40 in a natural sleep. Sunday, April 3rd. <clears throat> at 7 a.m., Robbie threw a pillow against the ceiling light, but then went back to sleep. There was another short seizure at 8.30, but Robbie went back to sleep until 11.30, then took breakfast. About 12 noon, Robbie walked downstairs but went into spells several times, but there was nothing of a serious note until 4 p.m. Robbie engaged in a ball game with his father, two uncles, and a cousin. At one point, he tried to throw the ball to his father but began to stagger as a drunken, as a drunken man. His father rushed to his assistance when the boy began to run in a straight line across the lawns of two of, two of the neighbors. He ran with his eyes shut and with high speed. Three men closed in on him and carried him back home. In the kitchen, Robbie lifted the heavy kitchen table with one of his legs. I guess it meant for one of its legs, but that's what it's. Robbie ate very little supper and seemed abnormal. On one occasion, he wrapped his question mark around the leg of the table, and he was pulled away by means of strong question mark force. Fathers Bodern, Van Room, Bishop, and O'Flattery, for Catholic priest, arrived at the home at 7 p.m. Within a few minutes, Robbie had a spell in which he grabbed at his aunt, and he would have torn her dress if several men had not come to her assistance. Robbie was carried upstairs fighting, but came to himself shortly after he was thrown onto the bed. This was Passion Sunday, so the fathers thought that God would put an end to Robbie's suffering on this night. The exorcism was begun in full, but there was no response at the Principio. One new feature of this evening was a kind of devilish prophecy concerning Robbie's little cousin. Shouting and singing in rhythm, Robbie repeated over and over for about 10 minutes, you will die tonight, you will die tonight. It was hard to quiet Robbie by any means but a pillow in his face. From 9.30 to 12 noon, there was no disturbance except snoring and restless sleep. The fathers departed at midnight, but more trouble began at 12.30. It became necessary to bind the arms of Robbie with tape and to place gloves in his hands. Then he complained of the pain from the adhesive tape and the heat of the gloves. However, when the tape and gloves were removed, Robbie went about his violence again. It was 3.30 before quiet came. Monday, April the 4th. Arrangements were made that the family was, uh, was to go back to Washington, D.C. by train at 9.30 a.m., uh, Robbie's father had lost a lot of time from uh, from his work, and the strain upon the St. Louis redacted was beginning to toll. Fathers Bodern and Van Roo were to accompany Robbie and his parents on the trip. It was difficult to to rouse Robbie from his sleep, but cold water dashed in his face brought him out sufficiently so that he so that he could be dressed. He was taken to the railroad station, accompanied by his father, mother, uncle, and friend of the family. There was no difficulty boarding the train. Robbie walked and chatted normally. What happened on the trip and thereafter will form another report. Jesuits who saw Robbie under possession were, uh, and it goes through a list here of, of people that, that saw this, uh, uh, Reverend George Bischofberger, uh, Raymond Bishop, a Jesuit, uh, Father Boland, Father Bodern, Father Burke, Father O'Flaherty, uh, uh, 
uh, Van Robe, uh, a Jesuit, uh, Mr. Halloran, a Jesuit, and Albert Schnell. So there's a whole list just of people here that that observed Ravi. Uh, in, this is so. This is well spell. documented. Yes, exactly. Monday, April fourth, in in route to Washington, there was there was no trouble on the train all day. One short spell of violence occurred when Robbie retired at eleven thirty p.m. Wednesday, April fifth, Robbie awoke normally on the train and was taken to his home in Maryland without a mishap. In the course of the morning, Father Bodern met Father Hughes, the assistant pastor at St. James Church at Mount Rainier, and found that he had made arrangements with the Chancellor of the Archdiocese of Washington that Father Bodern would have full permission to continue with the exorcism. Neither the pastor nor the assistant at St. James, in whose parish Robbie lives, was able to assume the full responsibility of the case because of lack of room for the boy. It was a thought advisable by all concerned that Robbie would not be kept at home. Fathers Bowden and Hughes tried several hospitals in Washington, but because of the nature of the case, no one was willing was willing to accept this burden. Wednesday, April 6th, Fathers Bowden and Father Hughes drove to Baltimore to inquire about a room at the Question Mark Institute. The Daughters of Charity were willing to take the boy, but the doctors objected since the case was not psychiatric, and furthermore, since the hospital was dependent upon the state of Maryland for aid, each client had to be accounted for on the records. It would have been strikingly, question mark, to include the treatment of exorcism. With disappointment in Washington and Baltimore, Father Bodern decided to call again on his devoted friends, the Al- the Alexian brothers in St. Louis. He called long distance and was assured a place for Robbie through the kindness of Brother Rector, Cornelius. Robbie was normal during the entire day. He took some exercise in the afternoon. Upon retiring, had one very slight spell, which lasted only seconds, and may have been a nightmare. Thursday, April 7th, at Redacted, Robbie was normal all day. He worked in the afternoon, spaded a little, and cut the lawn. Uh, but the evening spell lasted for five hours from 9.15 to 2.15 a.m. Okay, we're going to continue with the story. Again, we're, uh, we're reading the, uh, the actual notes by Father Bishop of the, uh, of the exorcist of Robbie Mannheim, I believe it was. Mannheim. Mannheim. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll return after these short messages. Don't go away. Welcome to our January 11, 2020 Spiritual Warfare Conference. Every year without fail, this is our most popular, well-attended event. This year's Spiritual Warfare Conference will host Adam Bly, a Catholic demonologist, and an auxiliary member of the International Association of Exorcists, along with Dr. Luis Sandoval, a psychiatrist who's part of the Healing, Deliverance, and Exorcism team for the Diocese of Orange. These two gentlemen bring tons of experience and expertise in the area of spiritual warfare. This is going to be a high-information Catholic seminar. I'll be there as well, sharing some riveting stories on the diabolical and liberation found through Jesus Christ from my best-selling book, The Devil in the City of Angels. Mark your calendars, come and join us, and meet other radio hosts from Jesus 911. Contrary to popular belief, spiritual warfare is not demon-centered. It's Christ-centered. Come join us and learn how to armor up and fight the good fight of faith. Catholics, wake up. Don't hit the snooze button. Join us at St. Christopher Catholic Church, 629 South Glendora Avenue, West Covina, California, on January 11, 2020. See you then. Strength and honor in Jesus' name. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And here's an easy way to support us, by going to smile.amazon.com and type in Catholic Resource Center or Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And when you log in your Amazon account and you purchase products, A portion of it will go right back in supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And it doesn't cost you a dime. I want to thank you ahead of time because that supports us year-round. May God bless you and your family. 
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Soul Patrol 10-8, uh, giving you some Catholic briefings, some Catholic intel. Put this stuff on your war bag. Go out there, love God, save souls, and slay error. This is the actual diary of the notes of the priest that inspired the 1973 blockbuster movie, The Exorcist. We've been sharing for about two shows now from the actual diary. We're going to start making some comments here. Here's the first thing that I want to comment on, Eddie, just uh, as an overview. We've already gone through, what, about 14, 15 pages, about three quarters of, of this diary. Yeah. Here's one of the things that I noticed. Number one, uh, delaying the bap- the baptism is something that Father Gabriel Amorth, in reading one of his most recent books, he says that he was he was treating this one possessed person, this energumen, for several months, and there was no effect. And then he just thought, he goes, well, I guess I, guess I, I should ask the person. It was a young adult. Have you been baptized? No, never been baptized. And then he, he goes, oh, okay. Uh, you want to be baptized? Do you want to be a Catholic? Yes, I do, Father. So Father Amorth baptized the person. He said within the, he said he did the old rite of baptism, which contains three exorcism prayers in the old rite, and uh, the, uh, the the demons left the body at the old rite baptism. So one of the things I notice here is that Robbie Mannheim, he was not baptized, uh, you know, as they're, as they're doing all these sessions over him, these sessions of exorcism. He was baptized as a Lutheran, but even the diary says it may have not taken effect. And, and there's a lot of reasons for that. If it was not done properly, remember, it has to be done properly, you know, uh, form, matter, and intent. Right. And, you know, the fact is, yeah, we do accept Protestant baptisms, but nonetheless, they have to be done properly as, as well. Proper form, proper matter, proper intent. So, uh, I just think that's one of the things that they should have just jumped on immediately. If we're going to start an exorcism over this boy, Robbie, we need to say, do you want to be a Catholic and do you want to follow Jesus? Yes, yes, I do. Okay, we're going to baptize you now, and then we're going to start these sessions. That's just something that I noticed that they could have modified. You, comment, Eddie? Anything else you want to comment on? We'll yeah, go back just, that, that's, yeah, that's absolutely true. I mean, the family, uh, having a Lutheran background, uh, made all the difference here. I think that... Uh, like uh, like you said, if if they had known that the baptism, the Lutheran baptism, was done improperly or or maybe not accomplished at all, uh, that would have been able to to speed up this process because we could see there's a lot of of battle that goes on with Robbie later on uh, during the during the baptism. But uh, but yeah, just that, that's something that I, I think is important. Just one of the other things I want to read part of the, a part of this again really quickly, and I want to say something. It said the mother continued asking questions but had no verbal reply. She asked this question, if you are redacted, knock three times. Then there were uh, waves of air striking the grandmother, boy, uh, the grandmother, mother, and the boy, and three distinct knocks were heard on the floor. The mother again asked, if you are so-and-so, tell me positively by knocking four times. Four distinct knocks were heard, then, uh, then there four uh, followed claw scratchings on the mattress. Just, it's funny because in uh, there, there's a part of this that, that talks about uh, uh, a wind, waves of air, and I know that in biblical language we talked about this very quickly. That uh, uh, that the word uh, uh, the word is wind and designates the presence of an unseen force here. So there's a the, the fact that wind blows at the time when they are, and this is before the exorcism started, just so this is probably uh, going on without the you know outside the presence of any priests. Uh, that uh, that they feel air when they are addressing a spirit, and uh, and I think that's important to to notice here because that unseen force, 
Here, the wind presents itself um, to signal the presence of a force, but it's an evil uh, force in this particular case. Yeah, Eddie, that's that's a good point that you, you know, that, that jumped out at you. And I'll tell you what's also problematic in the section that you just read is that they're, the, these Lutheran people are engaging in necromancy. Okay, well, this is, it's, a, it's a practice that's not allowed. They're uh, trying to communicate with the dead. And, and, uh, so, and we also know, it's not mentioned so much in this account, we also know that Robbie Mannheim's aunt was involved in witchcraft. She was involved in the Ouija board. That doesn't come out, and I don't think in this diary yet. I didn't read it, but uh, you can see that the the parents, his parents over here, you know, this is complete superstitious practice. Uh, you know, saying uh, if you are so and so, knock three times. This this is what's called a seance. That's the sin of necromancy, communication with the dead. So, even we could say that his his Robbie's parents were uncatechized. In other words. They weren't very well formed in, 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 in the doctrines of Christianity because, I mean, that's a basic Baltimore Catechism first commandment. Don't communicate. Don't have, you know, superstitious practices, divination. This is all an offense against God. Uh, and so that's something that j- yeah, jumps out at me is that we're dealing here with a family that's really uncatechized. And see, this is where Liber Christu, that's why I brought these two guys in. I think they're going to change the church in a good manner, you know, um, <clears throat> Dan Kyle, uh, uh, Kyle, Kyle, Kyle Clement, Kyle Clement, Dan Schneider, and Dan Schneider. These two guys are the the instructors for Father Ripperger's institute called Liber Christu, which is liberation through Christ in Latin. And all these three guys that have been involved for years in exorcism, specifically Father Ripperger, they studied all these cases, and they saying, okay, why did it take so long? What, what if they do right? What if they do wrong? And what they've come up with is they're saying, well, number one, they're praying over people that are in mortal sin. So there's going to be no effect. And the Bible tells you that. That's basic new. It's in 1 John chapter 5. You're praying over somebody that's, that's steeped in mortal sin. Guess what? It's like uh, uh, throwing a, a rock against uh, the side of uh, you know, Mount Gibraltar. Okay? Nothing's going to happen. So, so you, you can see in this whole case, and this is where you got like six or seven Jesuits that are involved here. What they need to do, and they're not doing it, they do like in the midst of these sessions, like, oh, okay, hey, let's read them a little bit of the catechism here. I think I've read once or twice where they pull out a catechism and start probably going through the Ten Commandments. Robbie Mannheim and what every energumen needs, they need to come, see, because their thoughts are disordered, Okay. And Father Ripperger and, and, and Kyle and Dan, they've noticed in years of doing exorcisms and these two lay people assisting the top exorcists in this country, what they've said is, in order to drive out the demon, you have to first order the intellect properly with the Word of God. When the intellect is now properly ordered versus being disordered, like Robbie's is, and most people that are possessed, now when the intellect is ordered, with the word of God, i.e. the Catholic faith, now it translates into the will. Now your actions are going to more and more be properly ordered because they're drawing from your properly ordered intellect. So as I'm looking at this case, there's none of that going on. They, this is triage. What I mean by this, this is the old way of doing it. Okay, And I'm talking from many exorcist friends of mine that criticize this method. They'll say, you see somebody that's manifesting an evil spirit. Okay, this this diary uses a lot the word uh, a spell. You, it's also they'll call fall into a trance or a spell. Same thing. But you see, it's like, uh oh, he's fallen into a spell. Bring the priest in. Boom, they start the right manifestations, physical gyrations. Okay, they did it for a few hours. He's calmed down. He's back asleep. Then a few days later, hey, come back. He's manifesting again. They run back like paramedics. Boom, the right again. Fights, manifestations, spitting, growling. In other words, what's missing there? What's missing there is what Liber Christu is trying to bring into the Catholic Church. You need to catechize. 
You need to properly form the possessed, the mind, because it's the mind that's attacked by the demons. But if the mind is filled with the right information, with the word of God, with the knowledge of Christ and his power, then the the will starts becoming properly ordered. And what you find in these, a lot of these cases, this is paramedic triage uh, type of exorcisms versus what Father Ripperger's brought into the church now. It's a medical model. It's a hospital model where the parish priest is the general practitioner. The Father Ripperger's Institute will tell the parish priest, you have the power to drive out the demon. These are the prayers that you pray after confession. You've got to be hearing this confession every week. If these prayers don't work after a certain amount of time, then you call us and then we'll do the solemn exorcism. And so Father Ripperger and others become what's called the specialist in the church, okay? Like the urologist or a gynecologist, they're the specialist, but they're trying to get every Catholic priest on board in the country saying, guys, don't run away from your obligation. You're all general practitioners of exorcisms by being Catholic priests. And so give them confession. Do these minor exorcism prayers. Lay your hands on them, okay? Uh, and then if you see that this is above your pay grade, if we have a very powerful demon that we're dealing with, then you call Liber Christu, and that's where the specialists come in. Eddie, your comments? Yeah, Jess, I think you, you made some good points there. One of the is that there was no Catholic catechesis there to start off with. That was definitely a, a flaw. And I think just uh, since 1973, since the movie came out, since Liber Christo uh, began to study this and other cases, yeah. that we've learned, we've learned a lot. We've learned a lot about about uh, uh, spiritual warfare. We've learned a lot about exorcisms, uh, and so God has has taken care of, of His church. And uh, I agree that, uh, that you know the uh, uh, you know let's not put ourselves too much above this right now because the, the reality is there's a lot of Catholics that that are just like you described just with no catechesis. They're speaking to demons. This is very commonplace even within the Catholic Church. So so let's not say, oh, yeah, those those Lutherans. Let me tell you something. Uh, we need to correct some <laughs> issues that we're going through right now, and especially right now, just in 2020, the, uh, the condition of our church. Mm. We have to get back to basics. We have to get back to catechesis. We have to train the troops. So, uh, yeah, let's, we'll be right back. Uh, we'll have one more segment on this. Uh, don't go away. on apologetics you have entered into virgin most powerful's apologetics dojo where we go wall to wall with defending explaining sharing the faith master apologist carlo brusara carlo welcome to hands on apologetics hey gary it's great to be back in the dojo my friend master apologist ken hensley welcome to hands on apologetics good to see you again gary good to be with you Michael Barber, welcome. You have entered into the Virgin Most Powerful Apologetics Dojo. Gary, thanks for having me on. We are chatting with Master Apologist Carl Keating. Gary, it's great to be back with you. Coming into the dojo is our good friend Steve Ray. Thank you, Gary. Good to be here. Tim Staples, welcome to Hands On Apologetics. Hey, it's great to be with you, Gary. Thanks for having me on. Join many others in Gary Machuda's Apologetics Dojo. We have some of the best Catholic apologists in the nation. Streaming live weekdays from 10 to 11 a.m. Pacific. Hands-on apologetics on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Jesus said in Luke 17, When you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have only done our duty. According to St. John of the Cross, God is pleased with the little deeds we do in secret. He takes more pleasure in these than in a multitude of grand works that we may do out of the desire to be seen by others. May God help us to do the things that please Him and not just to appear great in the eyes of others.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Jesus 911, two cops for Christ. This is a Soul Patrol where we give you some Catholic briefing and intel, specifically Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. We focus on spiritual warfare. Eddie, we're, uh, <clears throat> we're taking a look at this uh, diary. Uh, the uh, of the original exorcism sessions that inspired the movie The Exorcist. One of the things that just in reading so far about three quarters of it that we've shared on on two set two shows, the house was definitely infested with demons. There's all kinds of you know scratching on walls, scratching boards, beds jumping up. Um, th- this this uh, house definitely would have been all over. Uh, 12 television shows on the paranormal right now because, I mean, this was just a classic case of what the secular humanist would call a haunted house. We would call it a, a, a house that's demonically infested. Also, we can definitely see that Robbie, he was attacked physically, a, a very acutely. I mean, he's being clawed and scratched all over his body multiple times on multiple occasions. This is what's called oppression. These are physical attacks, acute attacks upon the body. Uh, and, uh, and boy, oh boy, did this young man, did he really, uh, uh, he really suffered a, a bunch of uh, a, a demonic oppression, physical acute attacks. We also see a lot of stuff happening in the house, things flying around, hangers and combs flying and stuff. Th- this is what would be called poltergeist activity. Poltergeist is a German word that means mischievous spirits i mean these are demons that are just trying to scare people and so they'll have they'll be they'll levitate things they'll move things across the room and it's it's just basically to let the persons though you know what we're in control of this house okay we run this house this is our house and uh and we're going to scare the heck out of you and keep you petrified there's also another on march 7th 1949 monday march 7th <clears throat> uh, here it is where it shows that they were playing with a ouija board it says The home of Robbie's non-Catholic aunt, there it is, an uncle, five or six relatives present. It says, the spirit questioned through an alphabetic medium on porcelain kitchen table. That's the Ouija board. So all kinds of stuff uh, was done here that attracted evil spirits. And this, uh, yeah, this, this case was a nightmare. Jesse, you know, the funny thing is, this is a 14-year-old boy in the 40s and 50s. So, you know, we can we can take from that that, you know, the, 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 the social media wasn't present there. The, the types of television was not available to him at that point. This is a 14-year-old boy back in the 50s, Jesse, that I would say was a lot more wholesome, mm. uh, notwithstanding, you know, obviously the playing of the Ouija board, et cetera, but was not uh, that... that uh, uh, hadn't been through life's challenges uh, like some older people, but this was brought on by a relative who believed in spiritualism. Like you said, there's evidence of it. Uh, and, and the fact that the house reacts uh, and, and, and like you said, was infested has a lot to do with understanding the, the background of the case because that's what made this thing so so easy. Well, it's easy now because we know so much more about it. But, uh, you know, 60 years, 70 years later, we understand some of the things that occurred there that were not obvious to the church, even the church back then. That's, yeah, that's right. I'll tell you, uh, the people that were heroes in my book were uh, some of these Jesuit priests. Some of the stuff that they saw, uh, it, would, uh, it, would make, it would make the hair on every part of your body just rise. They saw some things, I mean, they basically, in that room, Eddie, you know what it would probably sound like? If you dropped a microphone in hell, that's what they heard in that room coming out of that boy. 
these guys these guys were courageous priests. They were believers. Um, you know, unlike a lot of priests today, Ruben, that I mean, uh, Eddie, that wouldn't touch this stuff with a ten foot pole. This was a different order of Jesuits back in the forties, <clears throat> and also the real heroes of the day, obviously, <clears throat> is you know Almighty God. But talking about a, a more uh, outside of God, the the final heroes in the stories we'll see when we finish off this story was Saint Michael the Archangel and Our Lady of Fatima. So I just say that because according to the way the story has written, uh, these were the two saints that God used to drive out the demon. It, 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 in this case, it was probably the devil himself from from Robbie Mannheim. And so as Catholics, you know, somebody emailed me, Jess, uh, can you tell me what saints have power over the diabolical? Well, there's two off the top of my head. Uh, pray every day, you know, the St. Michael the Archangel prayer every day. You know, uh, pray the Fatima prayer. You know, the Fatima prayer is, oh, oh, my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell. That's the Fatima prayer. Pray that prayer, the St. Michael prayer every day, because we know those two saints were used very powerfully to drive off the devil and other demons from one of the most famous exorcism cases in the United States. Yeah, just and later on we'll learn about some other saints that were invoked there that played a huge part in this. One of the things I want to talk about really quick, just again, just just to reinforce the fact that this family was into occult type activity, and the fact that that these priests uh, heard about the case, they were already documented documenting it as we're reading it now they didn't back in those days have the teams they have now just for catechesis let me me, uh, read a quick uh part of this it says a spiritual a spiritualist was called in to use his formulae for ridding people of spirits but he had no uh no success just uh you know in, in my estimation this is this is never done anymore. In the How would anybody that was caring for this this uh, this uh, afflicted boy allow them to be in communication with spirits and making these kind of inquiries? It just doesn't happen anymore. And if I would assume that if the priests at that time had teams like Libra Cristo and other uh, other healing and deliverance ministries, that they would have been able to to knock this off at the beginning, and they didn't have the luxury of having that. Uh, they were more uh, more concerned with other things like getting it, it approved for uh, for exorcism, et cetera, et cetera, because they knew they were dealing with something very very powerful. Obviously, here, you know, Eddie, I I I wonder as I read that part in the diary, I don't know if they did this with the priest permission or I think. Uh, the family, I think, just took it upon themselves yeah, to do this. That's what it looks like. Yeah, it doesn't look like they, they say, Father, can we get a you no. know spiritist to come over here and uh, you know do his thing? I think they did this on their own again because the fact is they were not properly catechized, so they're figuring, hey, we're going to use all avenues. We're going to use spiritists and shamans and the Catholic priests, whatever it takes to, to drive these things out. So uh, again, in, in defense of the priest. Right. Uh, I don't think this was done no. it, what, by the, with their permission. Right. This was done in spite of what they were doing. They just took it upon themselves. Yeah, Justin, that's why, it, you know, it, in the event that, that we knew then what we know now, there would have been a team in place to guide the family along during this, right. this uh, uh, you know, the uh, diagnostic prayers that's there to, to determine what exactly needs to be done. So that would have been, that would have been taken care of. Yeah, it, uh, on March 16th, on Wednesday, there is this... There is this one time where it does talk about that they were catechizing Robbie, which which is something that should have been ongoing. It should have been something that was that precipitated the, the actual sessions. It says here, and th- this is a good thing, but again, they're doing this in the midst of this triage, you know, manifestations here. You know, he's in a trance here. He's in a spell here. Okay, let's go and do the right over him. And then, okay, let's give him some catechesis. This should have been done in preparation for all the exorcisms. Now, in hindsight, what we know through Liber Christo. But here's what it says. It says, <clears throat> then Father Bishop, uh, Mr. Halloran, and, Ro- Ro- and Robbie's mother and uncle and aunt of Robbie, this is the witch, by the way, <laughs> were called into the bedroom in order to, yeah, it's not a good to take a witch, <laughs> practicing witch, into an exorcism. No, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> yeah, so that, there's another thing that was like a, the priest should have made sure that everybody there was a practicing Catholic yeah. and in a state of grace. Okay. Exactly. okay, so that's just another kind of thing that I just point out there. You know, and, and people that pick an exorcism team, they pick very solid Catholics, the priests today. And it says, all those present knelt down beside Robbie's bed and acts of faith, 
hope and love and contrition were recited together. And Robbie said the prayers too. And it also said that Father Bowden helped him examine his conscience and make an act of contrition. See, so on March 16th, but this is way into the exorcisms, Eddie. Right. They start going into catechesis, which, in, you know, this, is, this, is, this should have been done. This, this should have been backloaded. They should have been doing this examination of conscience, a catechesis, act of contrition, acts of faith, hope, and love, weeks and weeks before they started the sessions to prepare his soul and to, and to reorder his mind to think like a follower of Christ. Yeah, yeah, d- just that's those are things that we now look back with 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 you know a little bit of, of insight there, a little bit of of knowledge now and from 2020. We're looking back and seeing all the things, and that's just us. You know, we're gonna yeah. we're gonna run this by uh, by uh, real experts, real experts here in the next couple of days. But uh, but yeah, just this is something that's very interesting. You know, one of the things that that uh, it refers to at some point in this same section is uh, uh, something about uh, two songs that he sang in a very eerie way. One was Swanee and one was Old Man River. And I want to just give... What's the, that all about? Yeah, you know what? There's some, there's some very deep theology here, but here's some of the words from the lyrics, Old Man River. It says, um, he must know something, but don't say nothing. He just keeps rolling. He keeps on rolling along. Long old river forever keeps rolling on. He don't plant tater, he don't plant cotton, ain't them that plants is soon forgotten. It says, but old man river, he just keeps rolling along. Long old river keeps hearing that song. Now it goes on just, and it says, uh, you and me, we, we sweat and strain body and all aching and racked with pain. Gets, I gets weary, all sick of trying. I'm tired of living. I'm scared of dying. So, Jess, there's a lot of to be taken from this. This is a, a, a demonically uh, influenced song that this little boy is singing, and not his voice. And he's uh, this is this is longevity. This talks about the longevity of the evil one, Jess. He's been around since the beginning, and he's just old, like old man. Ever he's going to keep going on. He's going to keep trying to. Put, and you know, there's a there's a way of singing this song that's, that has to do with. Uh, that I think refers to slavery, not just human slavery, which most uh, most uh, uh, you know uh, ha- most people had in those days, but this was a slavery, uh, a, a, a spiritual slavery. Just talking about the devil's talking about him being the master here. Uh, there's so much we could say about this. Just yeah. you know, he's talking about uh, ignoring victory in Christ. The devil just keeps on going, though, looking for the next victim. That's what uh, that's the that's story right. I pulled out of it. Hey, hopefully we'll see you guys this weekend. Uh, Eddie, uh, Ruben, myself will be there at the Spiritual Warfare Conference. Eddie and Ruben are going to be emceeing the conference, uh, and it's going to be a it's going to be a, 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 a what I would call an immersion course in Catholic spiritual warfare. Eddie, wrap it up. Yep. So uh, stay tuned for Gary Mashuda, Hands On Apologetics. We're all looking forward to this weekend. Uh, we're finally going to be together at one point and. Uh, talk about some of these issues that we uh, we talk about on the show. We're going to talk about them with uh, in depth with some of the experts. So uh, stay tuned. God bless you. Quis ut Deus. That's our war cry. St. Michael the Archangel pray for us. St. Faustina's Prayer for Priests Oh my Jesus, I beg thee on behalf of the whole church, grant it love and the light of thy spirit, and give power to the words of priests, so that hardened hearts might be brought to repentance and return to thee, O Lord. Lord, give us holy priests. Thou thyself maintain them in holiness. O divine and great high priest, may the power of thy mercy accompany them everywhere and protect them from the devil's traps and snares which are continually being set for the souls of priests. May the power of thy mercy, O Lord, shatter and bring to naught all that might tarnish the sanctity of priests. For thou canst do all things. Amen. Virgin Most Powerful, pray for us.